Um, we're off. So, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on another episode of Times Like These. Today, I'm joined with the legend, which is Mr. Andy Hodgson. Uh, you may recognise Andy from doing co-commentary with Mr. Phil Bird for the Claret. Um, Andy, how are you doing? I am doing marvellous. I've got all the gear, right? I've got all the gear. I've got my shirt from 2002. I've got a mug that uh, one of the viewers to the television channel that I'm on sent me for my birthday the other week. Look at that. Which means officially I have been named, according to this mug, number one fan. And even they put a picture of me when I had no hair on it. So it's all happening. Well, do you know what? Yours is... Uh... A little bit better than mine. I don't know if it's going to come up with the. So an old teletext, teletext mug. Oh yeah. With favourite Burnley game on it, and unfortunately, it's got Burnley three, Tottenham Hotspur two, Roman Pavlyuchenko scoring in the hundred eighteenth minute. Ah <laughs> uh, yeah, was that was that just before we nearly made it to Wembley? It was yeah. That's the Carling Cup semi final second leg when. Everyone said, you're not going to do it. You're not going to score. You're not going to get the three goals. And what a night. And what a night. I, I remember I was, I was in, I was in the second, in the Bob Lord stand, second row in front of the director's box, right, right, right behind the dugouts there. And uh, I thought, I, I thought the roof was going to come off the place. Unbelievable night. The atmosphere there on turf that night. It's, yeah. it was, it was something to remember. And, yeah, uh, even even though we were so close to Wembley, it still goes down as my favourite game because it was it was something special. Um, it was. So, do you have a favourite game, Andy? What? No, no, I've not liked any of them. They're all painful. Um, well, yeah. shall I, if, if I start at the beginning, the reason I became uh, a Burnley fan is because I thought it was funny, um, and. Uh, it, when, when I was growing up, my dad used to take me to Everton. My dad is a season ticket holder at Everton, has been his entire life. And he used to take me to Everton. And my parents got divorced. And I started to go to football on my own because I was like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go and see Everton. And I was, I was living in Harrogate at the time. And I, uh, the, re the reason I'm a Burnley fan is I lived in Haslingdon, in the, in the Rossendale Valley for uh, three or four years. So I was that close and was kind of watching over the hill. And then we were in Harrogate and I started going to a few York City matches that way. And then a few Burnley matches that way. And then suddenly York City played Burnley. So I went and thought, I don't know, don't know which end to go in. So I'll go in the York City end and um, York City were appalling. And every time I went to York City with mates from school, they would, uh, you know, we'd, we'd have a good time. But when I went to Burnley in the York City end, I'm looking over the fence thinking, this is, they're having a great time. And even though they're rubbish, and even though this team's rubbish, they're having a better time than us. So more and more, I started going to Burnley. More and more, I started watching Burnley games and just found it hilarious. Because even if the team were bad, it was really funny on the long side. Well, I went in all the stands. But on the long side, when I first went, there were no um, uh, toilet cubicles. You just used to pee against a wall down the back of the long side. And it I, it was just hilarious. I used to come away with stories. And I'd say to my dad, I'm loving this. I, I, go, and, I go and watch. I'm a I'm Burnley fan. I'm a Burnley fan. And he'd go, I can't believe this, son. You should be an Everton fan. You should follow exactly what your dad does. I am outraged that you should watch such rubbish in the lower leagues. And I was like, but it's hilarious. It's a great day out. And there's some football. But then there's these pies, and then this is funny, and then that's funny. So that's how I became a Burnley fan. So when you're a Burnley fan in, in Division 4, as it was then, and no matches are good, so it's really hard to pick your favourite match because everything is just slightly yeah. appalling, uh, is the truth of it. But, 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 then, but then the odd good game starts to come where you get like, promoted, and that involved York City again. So there's a kind of whole circle, a donut of York Cityness yeah, around yeah. the Burnley, <laughs> and then and then probably the the most memorable uh, early game then was the fourth division uh, winning at Bootham Crescent, and uh, and by that point I was I'd started working the media and I and my one of my first jobs was at, at BBC Radio York, and so I was working just down the road from where the game was. I thought I've got to go, 
and I, w- and I went in the in the Burnley end, couldn't believe it. And at the end, when we won two one, everyone invaded the pitch, and I was with a mate, and he goes, "Come on, come on, we're going on." And I went, "I'm not sure I can. I'm on the radio. Somebody might somebody might grasp me up. I can't invade a pitch." He went, "Shoot your face, you idiot! Come on!" And so we went <laughs> on the pitch, and I never got arrested or anything. It was great. So were your um, were your allegiances a little bit mixed then that day, or was it hundred percent Burnley? By that point, I was one hundred percent loving Burnley, and I still I still have a, I have a little look at my dad's team whenever where, whenever it's Everton Burnley, me and my dad wind each other up. I have a little look at poor old York City, who've never made it beyond the echelons of down there, and uh, and see how they're doing. And occasionally, a, a mate will will go to a York City game near me because I live in Surrey now. And uh, and I'll say I'll I'll tag along with you for old times' sake, but uh, yes, by that point I was well and truly loving Burnley, um, and uh, and I, I never forgot that that was a night where it was funny, but this was like triumph, and uh, I'll yeah. never forget the sound walking down Bootham back to the train station in York, uh, and all the Burnley fans, and it was like York City never existed, and you used to get that a lot at York City if a big team came, um, like a Sunderland. You know, in, in like Division Three, they just took over the whole city, and York City didn't exist because they were so small. And that night, I remember thinking, "My God, the whole place is claret and blue," uh, and rightfully so as well, because uh, you know they were they were back in the good times. And from that day onwards, they've never looked back. That's why we're in the Premier League, I think. Yeah, that's um, it. Were weren't it? That's really like as I say that that's just a little bit before my time. But my dad, obviously, he brought me up as a claret um so all my life all i've known was burnley and growing up you know he'd find that video he'd find the videos on youtube and he'd get them there and they've come to york in the thousands they're going home as champions you know all that and so even though i wasn't there it you know when you see the clip on the turf when they show it and it's like i'm experiencing it all over again even though i wasn't there so i bet it was a a hell of a day to a day out to to go watch Burnley win at York. Yeah, these these, these moments you never forget. You? you know, you forget a cold night in uh, in Colchester or a, a rubbish night in Rotherham. That that for sure. There's no triumph in that. But uh, but the the big times. You know, the the York Cities, uh, the uh, the Wembley Stadium in 2009. You know, th- those are the days that you absolutely never forget. And, and in fact, where we started off talking, you know. All the capital punishment campaign where we beat all the London teams yeah. and nearly actually get there. Um, and, it, and I think the weird thing about being a Burnley fan uh, is nobody understands it. And I, to this very day, everyone goes, you support who? Uh, yeah. I, and I, I've never wanted to be a glory hunter. And when I was at school, all the kids supported Liverpool uh, or Man United because they always won. And I was like, yeah. oh, "That's boy. It's, like, it's like being a Man United fan now is mortally depressing because you never win, uh, and then you do win a bit, but you're never near the big time." And that's like, but then when they're winning, it's but bo- being a Man City fan must be really boring, you know. Uh, whereas when we win, it's proper high. Our roller coaster is like the big one at Blackpool, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah. massive when we win something big because it's like this shouldn't be happening. This is you don't expect it. You don't no. need it. You don't, and I, I still, no. you know, every time we win something big in this day, you know, like last season was like, holy smoke, look at what we're doing. Um, so uh, that's why it's great being a Burnley fan because the lows, we all just kind of muddle along, crack on, just have a laugh while it's happening. But the highs, that's bloody amazing. Yeah, and I think it, I think like you say, it all comes down to, I don't want to use the dreaded term, but them lot down the road, and you know we're we're all quite local little working class clubs and you know we've not had the money pumped into us all right we've got a little bit more than we had you know quite a few years ago but we're still what is it 87 we nearly went out the league against Orient you know it's it's not that long ago when you look back it's less than 40 years so yeah it's 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 when we've got these laws we've got to appreciate the highs I think and think like you say even you know the day the day out in York okay it was fourth division it probably wasn't the same standard of football that we're used to seeing now but I bet it was a hell of a day out and you know as we were, were talking before about the uh the Carlin Cup match against Spurs 
If we beat Spurs now in the Premier League, it's amazing. The high is up there. But that night to beat Spurs when we were tipped for relegation at the start of the season, yeah, you know, it, it just epitomised Burnley, really. Little old Burnley, taking on Spurs and getting two minutes away from Wembley. Yeah. I mean, how cruel can football be? Well, it's, that's it. That's it. I mean, I, I remember um, at that season when Owen, Owen Coyle came in, I remember going going to Chelsea and, uh, you know, I, I've, I've lived in the southeast for oh, it's, uh, the year 1999, I moved to the southeast. And uh, so that was like a local game for me. It was just up the road, Chelsea. And um, during that period, I was lucky enough to, to know quite a few of the directors. And uh, uh, that day I was in the director's box. And I I spent most of my time thinking, well, we'll get battered here, but um, oh, this is nice. I looked up and they had heaters above the director's box, blowing hot air into fresh air. And I'm like, this is fascinating. I'm hardly watching the game. I'm like, look at the state of this. They're literally burning tempo notes. Rowan Abramovich is burning cash in fresh air. So I used to spend all my time going, this is bizarre. What are we doing here? This is really... And then suddenly... You know, it goes to penalties, and Adi Akin buys on, and and the beast saves one, and it's like, oh my god, we've just beaten Chelsea. It was like it, it was like we'd won the World Cup that day. It was, and the yeah. directors, I have to tell, give you a little insight into the way it was. If you won, not only as a fan do you go crazy if you're in the away end, but in the directors' box, they used to go twice as nuts, and <laughs> nobody liked it. If you were in the director's box and went into a lounge afterwards and you'd just beaten a Chelsea and you were little old Burnley, the faces, the disgust <laughs> on their faces was astonishing. And that made it all the funnier. And people back then, uh, like Brendan Flood, who'd got involved with, uh, with the club as well as, you know, Barry Kilby, who'd been there for years, you know, he was absolutely milking it and loving the fact, because he was a fan as well, as was, and, and still is, as is Barry Kilby and people like that. So when you won, it wasn't just, you know, the fans, the boardroom also went bonkers nuts yeah, running boy. around the place. It was just <laughs> hilarious. I bet the uh, the hospitality went a little bit uh, downhill downhill after that then. They weren't as uh, polite and, oh, yes, Mr Hodgson, what can That's we do right. for you? I That's bet it was right, a little yeah. bit more... Sour grapes, yeah. <laughs> they were raising their eyebrows and were not amused. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, Robbie Robbie Blake in his underpants. I remember uh, Brendan Flood pulling the pair on and running around in them over his suit. I mean, you know, that, that sort of jiggery pokery doesn't go down well, I tell you. <laughs> no, I can't I can't imagine uh can't imagine Mourinho letting that happen or <laughs> Well, no, 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 they're all well, they're all priests. The weird thing is that there was there was a time certainly when I was uh, in in that sort of hospitality, the snootiness, particularly because it was little old Burnley. And actually, the, the weird thing was, it didn't matter where you went, you know, you could go, you could go to Sheffield Wednesday, and because they'd had massive success for for loads of years, at that point they weren't rubbish. Sheffield Wednesday. You know they would be a bit snooty about things as well. I remember a few yeah. arguments with uh, with a few of the the board members and and having the privilege to be in there and just witness it and thinking you know because you think that's how the other half live. Look at them; they've got all that money and they're, they're running the club. But they were just fans as well. Um, <laughs> in fact, she won't thank me, but uh, but Sonia uh, Barry Kilby's wife uh, once uh, got turfed out of the uh, of the director's <laughs> box when we were at Norwich because she was shouting so much and the steward came down and had a little word and went, excuse me, uh, madam, you, you please don't use language like that. And uh, can you calm it down? You are in the director's box. And her face was a picture. And within five minutes, she'd done it again. And the guy had gone, come on out. And she's like, you throw me out of the director's box. <laughs> and that's, uh, Is this the wind up that Burnley was at every ground was just fantastic. Whether it was the away end or whether it was in the box, it was fantastic. Is that before or after Delia got on the pitch, started asking where everyone was? <laughs> it was it certainly around that because Delia was there that day. I remember because yeah. uh, you go in there joking about what pie are we having, and as Delia cooked it, um, which of course there, there were no real pies going on in the director's area. But um, uh, but it was around about that time, to be honest with you. Uh, I think I think all the uh, the Norwich uh, directors kind of looked the other way, uh, slightly thinking, "Oh my God, we've never had this before. What's going on?" Because everyone no, often in that area of the ground they do sit politely but i know every yeah. time every time i was in there we'd all leap up you know and we were surrounded so there'd be maybe 
I don't know, 12 seats or 15 seats that were Burnley directors and guests of. And uh, and, and so you're surrounded by the, the other fans. You're surrounded by the away, either yeah. fans, directors, you know. But even so, we, we would all leap up and be absolutely raucous because we were sold on the whole thing. You know, there was no kind of uh, sitting on your hands. No, no. I've only... I've experienced that twice, having to sit on my hands in the uh, opposition's opposition's area of the ground, shall we say. Um, and the first time was at Anfield in the our first season in the Premier League when we got battered 4-0. And I was only... 13 years old then so I didn't know how to sit on my hands at the football and keep my mouth shut and and I think by half time the blokes behind us because my dad had got it in a box with through work so it was like oh you'll have to behave yourself you'll have to go on with a shirt and you'll have to be quiet and you'll have to and I think by half time the lads behind us have clocked on that were Burnley fans and every time Beast made a save we're shouting Beast and they're going you fat <laughs> you know and <laughs> And to be fair, thirteen-year-old lad, so I didn't get now got kicked off. But yeah. second time I did it, we're at Goodison Park, and by then I'd realised how to sit on my hands and keep my mouth shut because I didn't want to get my head kicked in. Unfortunately, yeah. we lost that game, and Barnsley got himself sent off, so nah. I didn't have much to cheer about anyway. <laughs> no, I've I've found that when I when I've gone to to Goodison with my dad, um, in, in fact, in in the last in the last year. Uh, he, he said, well, come, come in with me, come in with me. All right. And then you have to sit there and stay. It's quite easy to sit there and stay quiet because, uh, yeah, we, we don't win that often at the so-called bigger no. teams, do we? No, no, we don't. Um, but obviously, like I said, it's hard to pinpoint one specific match. Um, obviously, the York one must stand out quite a bit. Are there any other specific ones? that stand out for you? Well, I the 2009 playoff um, final was, for the, for the very same reasons, absolutely unbelievable because um, I'd gone to many of the matches that got us to Wembley and then when we went to Wembley, I was like, well, you know, it's, it's not, not really for us this business, the Premier League, is it? I mean, you know, what the hell would we do if we got there? I mean, this would just be silly. So I had no expectations at all. I've still got in my head, you know, fourth division. Uh, we're we're a bit rubbish, and and we were a bit rag ragbag and bobtail uh, even then. But um, Owen Coyle had had changed the club out of all proportion, and um, uh, I, I started getting involved with Burnley when I was kindly invited to um, to host several of their dinners and players' awards dinners. There was me, Alistair Campbell and a few others that would help out just before Burnley was going into potentially administration. Um, so the sort of early 2000s when uh, ITV Digital pulled out and suddenly there was no money. And um, the uh, the commercial uh, guy at the time, Anthony Fairclough, had, had rung me up and said, look, you know, we're trying to raise some funds. Uh, can you, would you possibly come and host a, a dinner and a lunch and uh, we'll we'll sell the, the seats and try and put some money in? And uh, I said, sure. And Alistair said, sure. And we started doing stuff from then on. But uh, even even with that with that privilege, you know, um, we we didn't we didn't really expect to get anywhere. And then years later, Stan Turnant goes, bit of a dinosaur, but a lovely, amazing fella. And Owen Coyle comes in. And he was a totally new breath of fresh air and a phenomenal man manager. I met him a number of times at some of the dinners that I did. Uh, and it, it was clear that people just love this guy rather than fighting this guy. And I think a lot of the players before then, you know, you'd expect Stan just to clobber you around, around the head if you were a bit naughty. Yeah. Whereas Owen just, you know, gathered them up under a wing and gave them belief. And he shouted at them, you know, he would, he would I'll never forget, he would shout, uh, Robbie Blake, when he was on his side, constantly through the match, the words "switch on," and I never forget it because he just spent all this. Every time Robbie Blake went past, he'd go "switch on, switch on, Robbie, Robbie, switch on," and you could see Robbie going, "Yeah, I've heard you. I've, if I've ever <laughs> switch on, Robbie, yeah, he's, I think he's heard you, Owen." But he was he was positive, but at the same time, he was all over the team. He was fantastic yeah. for them. So to get to the two thousand and nine playoff final. We got there with an oddment of uh, of players in reality, and I expected nothing at all from it. And I sat through the game 
And my wife was on one side. Tony Livesey was on the other side of me. And I think both of us all the way through the game were like, nah, nah. <laughs> and then when Wade Elliott scored, it was like, yeah, but it's, yeah, but this is Burnley, isn't it? So give it a minute. Oh, my God. I've never held my breath so much in my life. Talk about a memorable game. And at the end, I mean, I was crying. I was standing, I was looking at Tony. The two of us were kind of like, what's just happened here? What, was, what do we do now? Because that's the Premier League. And what the, oh, Christ. I mean, it was the weirdest day ever. And I remember I was lucky enough that day to be in the players' lounge after. So all the players coming in afterwards, some of them in floods of tears, uh, the, the weird juxtaposition that day, because some of them knew their career was over at Burnley because we'd got promoted. Yeah. They knew the contracts had ended. So there's a little table of players that knew that was it. That was the end. So I remember going around yeah, the, 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 and, and saying, are you all right? Are you all right? Well, you know, that's probably me done. And you kind of, oh God, yeah, never thought of that. Clark Carlisle came in, floods of tears. You all right, you all right, Clark? And he was like, I don't know. I don't know. And he was like, oh my God. So the whole day was bonkers. And I'll, you know, uh, people remember it for Way Daily, it's goal and, and us getting promoted. And I just remember it for being the most bizarre day of, you know, mixed emotions of people being up, some people leaving, some people triumphant, thinking that that's it, I've made it. So, you know, that. That's one of the most memorable highs um, to get to the Premier League, of course. Yeah, I think um, I think in the last episode we're talking to to Dan about it and said, "Don't think there was a single moment where I didn't think we were going to do it." Like that season just seemed to be, especially from the Tottenham game onwards, just seemed to be. There was never a time where I doubted going on the turf that we were going to get all three points and even that day you know with the sun shining and the like, all the hype and the build-up for the couple of weeks before it I don't think there was a single moment where I didn't think we were going to win but I also don't think it had dawned on me at the time that if we won not only would we get all this money and we'd be a Premier League club and we'd you know we'd see we'd be playing these teams at Turf Motor it was we're going to be a Premier League team not just a team playing in the Premier League, we are a Premier League team. And Robbie Blake was a Premier League player for Burnley. And Wade Elliott was a Premier League player for Burnley. And Jay Rodriguez, this young lad, was going to be a Premier League player for Burnley. And I mean, obviously the career he's had now and still playing in the Premier League for Burnley. But yeah, it was just, it was a special day that day at Wembley. Yeah, yeah. Quite, quite, quite a bizarre day. I had to run off not not long after because we don't we'd had our our firstborn, uh, our daughter. It was the first time we'd left her with someone else, and uh, and so you know me me and the wife are like, oh my god, and she's like, we've got to get back, we've got to get back, and I'm like, we can't get back. We've just got promoted in the Premier League and we're in the players' lounge of the winning team. What are you on about? And she went, I know, I know, but I'll have to express me breasts. I went, go in the toilets. <laughs> she went but there'll be a queue I went oh god so we had to get off early and a lot, a lot of them then went into London and, and had a mega party um, and, yeah, uh, and I, I, I went home I went home and uh, and fed the baby <laughs> you must have packed off a couple of beers though when you got home and celebrated surely uh, yeah I mean I, I didn't come down from, from that for ages and then uh, and then the reality hits of uh, of the next season <laughs> and that, yeah. there yeah. you go that's that's the highs and lows because I have always got, even through that season, I enjoyed it because it constantly surprised me. But I always have this this inbuilt. Uh, we'll probably lose though because we're just little old Burnley. Because um, it's Burnley. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. a number of years ago, before um, before the club got taken over by the latest owners, uh, I saw uh, so Mike Garlic. Um, so he was chairman at the time, and we, we just we got off the train together at Millwall, and I was chatting to him, and I said, uh, "What's what's happening, Mike? With everything, how's, how's it all going?" He went, "Just said, a lot of expectation, isn't there?" And I went, "Yep." I said, "They all they all think we we should be Premier League and buying Premier League players, and we should, you know, with the, we're Man United now." And he went, "We're just not, Andy. We're just not." And you and I know where we've no. come from. 
and this is really hard, he said, and just trying to maintain anything, swimming like a duck, trying to sign players that, you know, the minute you go Premier League, the wages have doubled, you know, and he, he said, I've got, I've got Stoke who can offer more money to play at the bottom end of the championship. It's just really hard. He said, you know, the reality yeah. is if we end up back in that division or the division below, it wouldn't surprise any of us. He said, but the new breed of fans are like, but this is Premier League. He said, and we just have this inbuilt thing that goes, yeah, but remember where you've come from because we haven't got all the yeah. money in the world and it's not that easy. No, and I think that is that is one of the things of being a modern-day fan, obviously. Like I say, I've, I've grown up and we were first division champion, championship and then Premier League. You know, I've never seen us at the, the lowest of the lows, but even now it's like, I don't know, it's still... I have to pinch myself sometimes that we are Premier League, you know, but look at where we've come over the last 10 years. We've been promoted three times. We've got to the Europa League. It, all right, it was only the qualifiers, but we're Burnley. We got to, you know, we got to the Europa League qualifiers and I think when you look at the population of the town and how much money we bring in as a club and, you know, where we are, it's, it's still pretty amazing where we are right now it is it is and and the, the reality is based on the money uh the reality check uh, you know of all the commentary stuff i i've done with with phil bird I, i'll often make analogies about the reality of business the reality of players who are just employees and you know uh, when you support the team and it's just about the team and it's just about the football you forget all that stuff and you forget how it affects the world that you live in. And, and the reality is, geographically where we are, with the size of stadium that we've got, we're, we're less likely to attract the sort of money that Manchester City have attracted or Liverpool attract or Arsenal attract. And so it it is very unlikely we're, we're ever going to be anything other than, uh, you know, possibly bouncing up and down, more like a Bournemouth. You know, we're in that category. Um and once you, once you think, you know, it's like this season's been appalling. Uh, but actually, next season, probably be great again. And last season was a massive surprise. So I uh, I have that optimism. And when we're rubbish, I shut my eyes a bit. Uh, and I know there's good times around the corner or fun times, but I know we're never going to be massive. But that I like that. I like that. I like, yeah. I like the uniqueness of that. I like the small town club aspect of it. I love the fact that, you know, uh, my, my ritual... If I go to Turf Moor, uh, even sometimes when I've been in the hospitality, is to go to the Parkview Chippy and I'll put in chips and gravy, uh, <laughs> even if I've got another meal coming, and then go, I'll just eat light, thanks. No, I'm all right. Uh, you know, I, I, I love that. I love the fact that everyone stands around looking at each other, seeing what kit they've got on, which, which top from which era, and that's lovely, that is. And it's, But it's small yeah. enough that, it, you know, it doesn't... It doesn't feel, and no, no offense to to anybody who's who's a new new fan of the club, you know, from America or wherever they've come from, but that small town kind of group, it's tribal, which is what football is all about, yeah. and this club, you know, personifies that sort of tribal thing, still in that neat small little way, which is lovely for me. Yeah, and you get the same, you see the same faces every every match day, and you go. Like our rituals go to the park view and have a pint in there and you know, have a, have something to eat on turf and stuff. And you go in park view and you recognise the people in there and it's got to a point now where last behind bar knows mine and my missus is order because yeah. we go in that much and they recognise us and you is don't it, get that. When, is it still a creme de month? Team. Are you, you still having a creme de month? Is that what you have? No, no, no. I'm on to um sex on the beach now on match days. <laughs> <laughs> wow, good heavens above. Uh, that's quite the image you've painted. <laughs> no, 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 not like that. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, well, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever makes you happy, but uh, or sleepy as the case may be, you're probably asleep 40 minutes into the game. Let's not go into that. Depends who we're playing. Um, <laughs> so we'll uh, <laughs> we've talked about matches, so let's let's talk about some of the players that you've seen over the years. Um, yeah. Have you done your favourite starting eleven? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because it? that that question over the years um, changes obviously as you get new new players coming in and 
uh you know who's who's your favorite player and who's who's your favorite team and we've already mentioned earlier you know Robbie Blake always comes uh comes in that list in terms of favorite players but you know I was thinking earlier today if I was reeling them off uh Ash, Ashley Barnes of recent times Robbie Blake and the Glenn Littles of many years ago Wade Elliott has to come into that because of um Wembley 2009 mm -hmm. um but I did love uh, Robbie Blake was was the kind of character that felt so Burnley it hurt, um, and and it's whatever industry you're in, whatever you do, whether it's football or doesn't matter what you do, whether you do graphic design doesn't matter, uh, you find your level. Uh, but you only find your level by going higher and higher, and then suddenly you go, hang on, this is not my level. And Robbie Blake never seemed to be that much the big league, but seemed really comfortable in whatever league we were in because it just felt right for him and i think maybe that was partly where he was born how he, how he was brought up all these things affect you uh, but he always at burnley was was comfortable was right was sparky for us so he, he was exciting uh, he was gritty he he would grind stuff out but have flair so he kind of had had everything for me that that made him an exciting uh, burnley player and he's he's also a lovely bloke as well i've interviewed him many times um, on on the radio over the years, and he's he's down in Bognor Regis now, uh, and uh, and seems quite happy down there with with the family, uh, running a, a small team with with no aspirations to go anywhere else other than uh, other than being Bognor because he's been there for years. And so I think the the combination of a nice bloke with a cracking sense of humour, um, with with a pair of you, you, I can never forget the image of uh, of his bad beat Bob underpants. Uh, which he used to reveal at every every possible occasion, and so and that that personifies the humour of the Burnley that I yeah. you know that I started loving. Um, and, and actually, this it, it might just I might get lucky. There might be somebody watching that humour, right? I'll tell you one of the days that I found it funny is I'm standing on the long side, old long side terrace, toilets at the back, no cubicles, purely pee against the wall, and. The, I can't even remember what game it was. Uh, but the fun, I'll never forget this. Suddenly, all the way down the, the stand, somebody shouts, bloody hell, who's farted? And then they repeat it all the way up. Somebody goes, somebody's farted. Somebody's farted. Who's bloody farted? Is that you that's farted? And it comes all the way up the stand. But to the point where half the stands absolutely peeing themselves, laughing that somebody's dropped one all the way down there. No one can smell it, but they think it's hilarious at the same time. But so that kind, that bizarre, inane humour. Uh, Robbie Blake had that with his with his underpants. Do you know what I mean? It kind of yeah. <laughs> the little bits like that. You go, you're my man. I like you for that. Yeah, yeah. I think as well with Robbie, it was the as you say, he epitomised everything that was Burnley, and everything but he left a couple of times and came back yeah. like the fact that he was drawn back to us there was there was obviously something there and I know we said about the same with matches but he scored some goals as well that I think cements him as not just a cult hero but as a legend just for everything that he did as a person as a player as a Burnley player yeah, and I, I suspect uh, he was pivotal to the team inside as well because of that sense, that banter that Ashley Barnes has had over the last sort of ten years. I think Robbie Blake had before that. He he was the joker in the pack. Uh, he would create the fun on the team bus. He would get the games going. You know, with him, it was it was poker. Um, you know, and 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 then you think of Barnsley, you know, getting a a, a mini bus with uh, with Westwood and driving in and picking up the other lads like it's a taxi. Yeah. It grounds everybody, and I think that that's yeah. that's the thing. Those those two are grounding characters, uh, and that's why we love them. Uh, and at the time, at the time, you, you maybe don't realise it, and then suddenly you go, "Hang on, you're quite funny, you are." But yeah, I mean, the goals he scored as well. Um, you know, you you think about that first goal against Manchester United. Uh, and there were there were plenty more before it, but uh, but that goal you just got that'll do. That if you don't score another yeah. one all season, that'll do. We can get relegated now. I'm absolutely fine. That'll do yeah. for me. Yeah. <laughs> and of course we did. <laughs> <laughs> but he did score another cracker at that season. First first at Ewood, weren't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. He he was. In fact, he's on my mug for free kick against Spurs. So he is. Yeah. 
Well, ne- well, now a lot of people don't realize. Let me turn my mug around to the other side. Uh, that's what he actually looks like now. Spooky. It's spooky because we, we both look the same, but he looks like that now. That's... All right, Robbie. He, he doesn't say much. If you're days. listening, Robbie, he doesn't mean it. You're an I absolute do. legend. Do. He doesn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure um... you still look good in your beat Bob bad pants. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably wearing them now. I suspect I probably wears. He's probably got fifty-seven packs of them, and he wears them every day. Never a dirty pair. He's, he's not. He's not a dirty man. Never a dirty pair. I heard, I heard that's why club shops sold out of them so quick when they brought them in. Yeah, he bought the whole lot just for the future. Uh, just it was an yeah. investment in he in his own underwear. That's what he's done. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. That's why I missed out on him. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I'm assuming we've got Blakey and Barnsley in your starting eleven. Who else joins them? Yeah, good, good point. Yeah, so the, that, that was the question, wasn't it? Sorry, I, I like to go off on tangents, you see. Um, right. I've had a creme de month. That's what it is. Um, so, well, start, starting 11. So, I, I it's a tricky one who goes in goal for me uh, because you mentioned Beast earlier, and I did like Beast. I, You know, he was, um, he was there at many of the Players' Awards dinners that I hosted for Burnley. Uh, always deadpan. Uh, still is. <laughs> you can never never got quite the same sense of humor as the others visually but he has got a sense of humor and i used to love shouting yeah. beast pointlessly uh you know even when he did a goal just a goal kick and i'd shout beast because it was funny again it's the same thing again and you see we're coming every time we're coming back to it it's the the ones that are funny it's now funny. Murich last yeah. season i loved so i'm like oh would have put him because last season when we started i was like oh my god what the hell are we doing here i was terrified every single game and then slowly you just go this is fantastic he's he's all right him so M- murich i'm thinking can't he can't be a legend on, based on sort of one season though so can't be him and then uh then i think about tom heaton solid dependable inspirational for the team and then i think about nick pope uh who's who's a lovely fella um and was great for us the right height well grounded again um, I've interviewed Nick a number of times for for the radio show that I do, uh, and he's he, when I ring him up sometimes he'll go, uh, I'm not sure I can do it now, Andy, because I'm 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 in the playground on the swings, and I'll go, you doing what? What are you doing that? What are you are you training? He'll go, no, no, I'm just with my kids, and he, you know he just gets on with his normal life, lovely fella, very very grounded, but got to be got to be Tom Heaton. Um, because, you know, I look now and often you look at Man United starting 11 and then I wait for the subs and go, there he is, still there, yeah. still backing him up. Um, so really inspirational character and great for Burnley uh, for, for the reasons that we know and, and coming, you know, coming back in uh, and edging Joe Hart out the way to give the stability to the team. But right, right throughout the period that he was there, really strong leader in the team. So he probably ends up as Tom Heaton at the back for me. Um yeah. Defenders mixed between uh, early doors, people like Steve Davis, uh, who, who again, the, the guys who are genuine, grounded and lovely. Steve Davis, Michael Duff. Michael Duff always comes into my mind in defence as, as one of my greats for the team, mainly because of his dance. Yes. Love that. <laughs> um, for. for no better reason than that. Uh, and also he was quite good. Um Everyone always mentions Kieran Trippier because he's exceptionally talented. And, uh, you know, you, you, you watch him at Newcastle now and still, uh, you know, you think he's a good lad. He is. And he, he's he's the backbone of that team at Newcastle. Um, but he was yeah. great for us and, and extremely talented and and, and out, out of his skin and ahead of his game and all of that when he was with us. Ben Mee, you would always talk about as a, as a first 11. I think most people would. Because he was solid through the years, and in the early years, I didn't. I didn't think he had enough. Um, I knew. I knew a guy that had. Uh, I think he'd gone to school with him, and he and he'd keep keep a check, and he'd say, "How's Ben doing? What do you think?" And I go, "I'm not sure. You know, I'm not sure." And then suddenly, physically, he got there, and then was solid as a rock, wasn't he? Um, so he he comes into consideration. Charlie Taylor always always catches my eye. I think he's. Uh, a lot, a lot on underplay him. He's he needs more confidence, and yeah. then suddenly he's a he's a flair player and a solid player. Uh, most and he's consistent, so you kind of look at him. And then and then Stevie Coldwell because of the the two thousand and nine playoffs and all around that time, 
Um, you know, he, he's now in, in Canada, but again, he's a solid fella, straight talking fella. Uh, all, always amazed by the the overachievement that they had and the success that they had. And he loves that period and he loves talking about Burnley. Um, but you can't have six defenders, can you? So, uh, <laughs> sometimes I wish we could. Sometimes <laughs> I wish we could. Well, hang on, with Sean Dyche, we used to. Uh, if, if you remember, some well, of yeah. our best times were nine, ten, eleven at the back. Followed by see what happens now, and I quite like that. There yeah. were days where that was very relevant. So it's in which case I'm having six keepers at the back. on bench. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so I'm having six at the back, fifteen in the middle, and seventeen up front. Um, <laughs> <laughs> through the I just, through the midfield, obviously Robbie Blake. We've talked about Glenn Little uh, has to come into play. Um, I heard you say on one of the earlier podcasts that you'd done that you wish you could see him playing in teams now um and uh and and seeing his his gangliness uh he kind of well, shall it's I tell strange you, actually yeah because i did see him play in a burnley team last week oh, the veterans um, thing the veterans at, um at colm yeah it were same time kickoff as the west ham game so i thought you know which which one do i uh do i try and uh my dad had texted me and said Jensen's gonna be there. Come on, you know we'll go. We'll go down. So I go, go on, then. Beast's gonna be there. I can give him a little bit of a shout. And Peyton's gonna be there. And Glenn's gonna be there. And Beast didn't turn up. I think someone said something had happened to his foot or something, so he weren't playing. But Glenn were there, and he's cut. They're coming out at dressing room, and I'm ten year old again, going, Glenn, can I get your autograph, please? And they're walking out, going, bloody hell, it's freezing this, isn't it? And so yeah, and I tell you what, I still have him, and I'd still have Andy Payton. Would you? Yeah, yeah. I well, he leaves. He leaves a great impression uh, because he could do things that nobody else on the team can do, and that was, you know, everyone else was set to stand in stone, uh, kick you up the backside. And then launch it up front to whoever happened to be there. But he was like, got the ball, head down, let's just beat the lot of you. Uh, and I, I love that attitude. And um, but I'll give you a bit of gossip about Glenn Little, shall I? So oh, oh, since he's retired, and over the last sort of 10 years or so, I've seen him in press rooms up and down the land, right? Glenn Little must have hollow legs. He eats more than any man I've ever seen. And he, he has this little game in the press room, right? Where whenever he's there, I'll come in and I'll go, oh, have you had, have you had some food? And he'll go, yeah, I've had some food, Andy. But if you're not having yours, can you get yours and then give it to me? Because they won't give me second L pins. It is this every game. If there was a pack, of, a pack of sandwiches during COVID, we got luckily to go to games and they'd just do sealed bags of stuff. So it was all sanitized and all that. And he'd be like, can I get your bag as well? He'd have like three meals before kickoff. He, and I, I, it'd become a running joke. I'd come in and go, how much have you eaten? You, you're not having another one. I he'd go, yeah, yeah, I've filled my pockets full. So um, he's, he's, he's on a diet now of uh, seafood and eat it. That's literally, that's your gossip <laughs> about Glenn. But he's a lovely fella. Uh, and he loves, the, he loves the club uh, to this very day, which is why he'd turn up for the veterans. And, uh, you know, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't live anywhere near Burnley, but he'll travel the length of the country and, and did do the other Sunday, uh, just to be involved and, and, you know, see people like Paul Weller and, and enjoy himself. So he's a great fella. Yeah, yeah. He was were, he were lovely, like I say, our 10-year-old going, can I have your autograph, please, Glenn? And he coming out like absolutely freezing. But you know what? He stopped and signed pictures for everyone and took pictures. And yeah, what a guy. He's, he's unusually tall, isn't he? When you, when you meet him in real life, you do end up going, Christ, you're really big. Yeah, I I didn't realise how tall he really was. Like I've always known that he was tall, and I've always known he was, like I say, a little bit gangly. But I never realised how tall and gangly he actually was. Yeah, yeah. the weird the weird thing about him now, I get I gave him a lift. Um, where were we? I think we were at Coventry, and I was parked in a car park, and he was parked way down the other way. I said, "Do you want a lift?" He said, "Yeah." He gets in, alters the seat almost to sit in the back seat. And where are you going? What are you doing, you? And he went, a bit small, this, isn't it? Now, I had a big car at the time. I drop him off, and the irony was, I drop him off next to his car, and I go, is that yours? And he goes, yeah. He had a Ford Fiesta. <laughs> he must have been sitting in the boot driving home. Quite incredible. 
quite incredible. Anyway, so I'll tell you the rest of my midfielders. David Ayres, for a similar reason to uh, to Glenn Little, is he could do the the bob and weave stuff that was impressive. Everybody loves a player like him, so similar category. Loved it when Graham Alexander was sort of defensive midfielder. Uh, Grezzo's a fantastic player for us, grinding it out, inspiring the team. His penalties were fantastic as well. So I put him in midfield in the latter part of his career. And uh, players like Ashley Westwood I absolutely love as well because when he wasn't in the team uh, for Burnley, you knew we might well get a bit of a pasting because there was no one stopping and creating. So that that that, that set of players kind of fill out the midfield. Um, and then when you get up front, uh, Ashley Barnes uh, uh, always gets a mention because I, I love his non... His, well, let's call it what it was. I love his anti-football um, because of uh, how, you know, let, let's be honest, Ashley, for part of his career, used to not go, how can I score? He'd go, how can I fall over here to gain his advantage yeah. and get us up the pitch and get us a free kick? And that was the big joke. Anti yeah. it, was, it was fantastic. The wind-up of anti-football with Ashley Barnes sitting with Phil Bird a number of times at Chelsea. And if we were unlucky enough in the press box to have the last seat, you're literally next to the Chelsea fans, to say they hated Ashley Barnes and our team was an understatement. And the number of times stewards had to come down the side to protect us as we're live doing the, the, the Clarence Plus thing. They were all over us. You cheat, falling over all the time. And of course, we just found it hilarious because it's a massive wind-up. So... So Ashley Barnes and his anti-football uh, have to be in the front row. But there's there's lots of players up there that I think, you know, Gareth Taylor and his heading ability. I loved it when he was playing. Uh, honest, decent bloke at Man City Women's now. I still speak to him quite a lot and he, he loves the Clarets a lot. Charlie Austin, uh, similar reasons, still in the game at, at Swindon. And uh, a couple of times a season, I have a chat to him for, for my radio show. And, um, you know, he, he's a Liverpool fan. But he loves the Burnley and he he loved his time when he was there as well. Um Ings and Vokes, of course, after after come into it for their the way they they gelled and created some beautiful stuff. Yeah. Um Adi Bai has to come into it because he was just fantastic. Um when he played for us, I always thought he had a chance of scoring. Um so that's uh, that's too many strikers. I could I should probably only have two. And if I was, Ashley Barnes has got to be one of them because it was funny. Uh, and and maybe maybe then it's maybe it's Danny Ings or yeah or maybe it's Adi Akinbai. I don't know. I couldn't choose there. Look, I've put to, I've I've got three squads in there. I've got the the A team, the B team, the academy, and the youth squad. And then we've got the one just to be funny because can you imagine Barnes, Barnsley and Adi Akinbai up front together? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I don't think I don't think Akinbai would make it past thirty seconds. I was going to say, see if we if they could both get sent off in the first 10 minutes. That would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> see, but, but Barnsley, um, Barnsley rarely got sent off because he was so clever with it because he spent all of his time yeah. looking with the, the ball coming that way and he spent all of his time going, go on, hit me. Go on, hit me. Because if you hit me, I'm going down. Yeah. Go on, hit me. Oh, I'm on the floor again. What's happened here? He spent more of his time doing that uh, than he did yeah. scoring goals, which was which was just what we needed. Anti-football. Yeah. yeah. Except for last season when he had a little bit of a... I think Vinny must have changed his diet and everything else because last year he was a bit of a revelation, weren't he? And it almost reinvigorated his Burnley career, shall we say? Because I don't think he was everyone's biggest fan. Uh, no, before no. before we got to play them what down the road. But I think after that, it's where do you want your statue, Ashley Barnes? <laughs> it, it, it was nice that that company changed because I thought, well, he's out straight. You know, if you if you do a list of well, this isn't going to work because these players just don't fit, you know. And and yeah. players like Westy knew it wasn't going to be quite right for them. Some of the others went, well, I'm going to hang on. And, and you know, to go back to what I said earlier, football's a business and involves families and disruption and schools and children. Yeah. And, you know, and the relevance is somebody new comes into any club. With ours, it was Vincent Company. And he says, we're going to be mini Man City. And some go, you do what? And then you go home and you go, this is never going to work. And your wife says, the kids are in this school. I'm doing this. My mother lives down the road. You shut your face and get in there. So what we don't see yeah. is the, the home life and reality yeah. uh, of these yeah. places. So, and we're like, why the hell have they hung on to him? Why is he staying? Why is he gone? And it's for a myriad of these reasons. But um, but yeah, uh, 
uh, Westy was uh, was was one of those that I think had gone. Yeah, I'll get out of here as soon as I can. But but yeah. Barnsley, I thought would do that. And to his testament, companies obviously gone. You're not going. So how can I create for you? Stop falling over. Just face it and distribute it. And we'll have a marauding set of players that anyone can score from Murich onwards. And as long as you take yeah. it and pop it there, they'll just come in behind and score the goals. And it worked wonderful when he played like that. Yeah, yeah. And like you say, it's it's a whole disruption. And I think even Westy, to be fair, I think he's he's just a little bit older than Josh Cullen, isn't he? That's all, that's the only thing he had on him. I think Cullen or I might be a little bit higher of a pedigree, but I'd still like to see Westy in this this company team. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, he, yeah, he might he might have had a chance, but I think when this wholesale, I think when you've been part of a group where you've been part of a group and now the group doesn't yeah, exist, it's and you think, well, who am I in this group? And the new guys bringing in lots of new guys and saying, "You're my man." And then he says, "And, and who are you?" Yeah, I mean, you're my man as well. Uh, but you know, it's not as heartfelt, and it wasn't as heartfelt as yeah. the guy before who said, "You stand in the middle, you make it all happen." I love you. Uh, there's a difference, and the difference is your confidence. Yeah, um, and I think once he'd had his injury uh, at West Ham as well, you know, he must have gone. Actually, let's just try something new because uh, it's going to be hard to get back in after that injury. Uh, and, and a great opportunity for him in America uh, again with his family. You know, you go and do a couple yeah. of years there. You might spend the rest of your life there, or you just go. Actually, what a great experience! So, um, yeah, you know, and him, him, and him, and both uh, him and Scotty. Scotty Arfield are smashing it out there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they seem uh, to be. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully. He can, Although uh, they look at Barnsley at um, at Norwich because uh, that was a yeah. huge move when when he signed for them. I spoke to him a couple of weeks after, and I and I, st I started off and said to him, Ashley, you do know where Norwich is, don't you? And he said, he said, yeah, very funny. You felt, he said, I did have to check the map actually. I said, look, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea what you're doing going to Norwich. Surely, your wife said. Get a job at Stoke, then we can stay at home. And he went, you're not far off? He said, and I did have a chance to go to Stoke. And he said, and do you know what? We just finished the house. And we'd finished the house. And it's so unique to us. We've built certain rooms that we like. And he said, and it's perfect. And the kids are at the right school. All the stuff that I've been talking about. Yeah. He'd gone, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, but, you know, you're not going to finish a game at Norwich and then be home at, you know, half past six. Uh, this right. is huge. Surely you're going to take the family because otherwise you're going to be on your own. And he went, yeah, it's a, it's a huge thing. He said, and, and Stoke would have been easier. Um, he said, and I've had to say, you know, I'm going to bring the kids. I'm going to bring my wife. It's going to be a major change. He said, and, you know, I don't know what we're going to do with the house at that point. Uh, he said, but we're going to have to make the, the change lock, stock and barrel because you've got you've got to live there if you're in Norfolk. It's just, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, you, you're quicker to get to Brussels on the train, aren't you? It's bloody silly. Um, and I'm, so I'm really pleased because so many of those moves don't work out for players because no. of all the reasons off the pitch that's really hard. You know, kids hate the school. Your wife moves to somewhere and goes, where the hell are we? I hate this. Um, so I'm really pleased that he's he's obviously settled in the area. Uh, because he's doing so well and he's enjoying it. And you see him on social media, you know, getting his goal and getting his three yeah. points and really pleased for the man. Yeah, yeah. It it always seemed to me that it were a little bit strange that we didn't offer him an extension. But then obviously it looked like Vinny's come in and said, you're not in my plans for next season. We'll see where we can fit you in. And obviously things turned out as they did and he ended up being actually quite a big part of our season last year and maybe conversations should have been had, but that's not for me to say. Um, but it always felt that if he was going to leave at the end of last season, that he was going to hopefully retire and go into coaching and maybe coach at Burnley and learn off company and Bellamy and stuff. But it's brilliant to see. He's one, he's one of those players that, He's left. There's no hard feelings between us and him. Um, I don't know how he feels about Burnley. I can imagine it's similar to how we feel about him. Um, and it is. He absolutely loves it. Well, you you remember him at the end of, at the end at the promotion and everything. You know his emotion yeah. of of being. Uh, you know what the fans were, what the town was, and what the club meant yeah. to that key period of his career. So he does absolutely love it. And in and in fairness to that, he he was he said, look, he said this publicly. Uh, you know, Vincent has been very honest. 
Uh, and that's great to be able to be honest to plan rather than be ignored yeah. as as happens in so many uh, businesses and, and football clubs where you think, what the hell's going on here? And then you find out, you know, from Sky Sports that you're out on your elbow. Um, you know, in fairness to Vincent Company, though, he seems to trade in forward motion is everything. And therefore, I've already got a plan for next week. I've got a plan for next year. Yeah. And sometimes that'll work as it did in his first year. Uh, and sometimes it won't, as it hasn't in his second year. Um, I just hope in uh, next season that it works as effective. Because now, yes, what we it. don't know is that forward planning. It, he's already there. He already knows who's going. He's got a fair idea who's coming yeah. if they can pull off the deals. And that forward motion means you're always fresh, and there's no stagnant. You've just got to get on his train or get off. And I, you know, I I can I can respect that. I think Dice was was different in that he, he had his train and it was quite a small one carriage thing. Whereas I think Vincent company's got an express train with, with eight carriages on it and you either jump on it or you don't. Uh, so it's just very different to, to Sean Dyche. Um, but, um, uh, you know, at least, at least Barnsley finished on a, on a solid handshake and has gone on to success. So, uh, everyone's a winner at the moment. Well, apart from, apart from Burnley this season, but you know, everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> everyone else is a winner. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think, like I said, last season, Barnsley, he reinvigorated his career and to score them two goals against them lot down the road sort of sort of cemented his place as a Burnley legend, I think, um, as of many of the people we've talked about tonight. Yes. Um, yeah, Andy, I won't keep you too much longer because I'm sure that... Uh, Glenn Little will be knocking on your door soon, asking for a butty or something. I can see him outside my office now. He's in the kitchen. He's going through all the drawers. He's like the tiger that came to tea. He's drinking daddy's beer. It's not on. It's a bit weird, that, actually. <laughs> Glenn Little, that came to supper. I wonder if they'll make that <laughs> Uh Yeah, let, let's, uh, let's ring up one of the lads and get him to write a book about it. I like that. One for the kids. Nice. Yeah, definitely. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll get that. You can... 50% uh, royalties, half and half. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. Andy, we'll split it's that been... five. <laughs> Andy, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, times like these, everyone who's listening or watching, uh, feel free to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, all about bringing a bit of positivity to Burnley this season because, let's be honest, so far it's been crap. Um so let's talk about the good times and remember them. Talk about the legends. Talk about the happy memories. Uh, Andy, if you want to give a shout out to anyone or let people know where to find you, feel free. Well, I will do. Uh, don't miss my show every week across the UK on Fix Radio. Uh, the Friday sports kickoff in the afternoon or the podcast that follows that up. I have all the footballers on and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you a little secret. Every week, I mention Burnley without fail. And they haven't sussed me yet or fired me. So um, you can see me on the telly a bit, but listen to the sports there and you'll hear a bit of Burnley every single week. Brilliant, Andy. Thank you very much. I'll be listening to that at work tomorrow, I can guarantee. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, remember, if you want to be involved, come on the show or anything, just drop us a message and we can sort that out for you. Up the clarets. <laughs>